This is Listen Lakeland, the show that keeps you up to date on all the things that make our city a great place to live, work, and play. Today's host is a graduate of Florida Southern College, a native Floridian, and was elected to the City of Lakeland Commission in January 2019. She's the chair of the Citrus Connection, a utility committee member, mayor pro tem, transportation planning organization member, and serves in many other roles which provide her the opportunity to serve others. Her passion for youth is fulfilled through her direction of the Randy Roberts Foundation and the Harrison School for the Arts Parent Association. She serves on the Education Committee of Lakeland Vision and is a four-year member of their Board of Directors. Please welcome your host, Sarah McCarley. Welcome to the Good Life. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Sarah Roberts McCarley, and it's a great to be hosting this month's episode of Listen Lakeland. This show is an extension of Lakeland Vision. For over two decades, Lakeland Vision has been a voice for the citizens of Lakeland, working with community stakeholders to create a bright future for our city. Today on Listen Lakeland, we are excited to have leadership team members from Bonnet Springs Park. First, we have Josh Henderson, the president and CEO of Bonnet Springs Park, and Kirsten Hine, the vice president of programming. Welcome to both of you for joining us for Leadership Lakeland today. Thank you. Thank you. We're so glad you're here. Uh, Bonnet Springs Park just celebrated its first anniversary here in the city of Lakeland, and it has just been a gift to our entire community and beyond. And I'd really like to start with Josh and just have a history of where we started, how the park came to be and why it was given as a gift to the community at large and, and, and what you've seen so far in coming to Lakeland. Yeah, so the the history, uh, local realtor David Bunch um, had been representing the old CSX property. Um, and in 2015, 2016, he really had this, he has, the guy has a passion for parks and, and he always says the great cities have great parks. And so he, he saw an opportunity um, to, to turn that piece of derelict property into something beautiful. He went to Carol and Barney Barnett and sold the vision. And uh, Carol immediately signed on as, as well as Barney. And so they started down the road of turning this piece of property into what you see today. And along the way, um, recently retired uh, City Parks and Rec uh, Director Bill Tinsley joined and so you had three families take off and um and and start this entire process which was uh volunteer led and um i think a much bigger project than anybody ever saw it, it being and so now here we are you know seven years later and and we see it finally uh come to fruition we had our first birthday saw almost twenty thousand people come out to the park that weekend and uh, and saw just a little under 1.5 million in our first year. So the community has embraced, and uh, it's just been spectacular to be a part of it and watch it um, all kind of unfold. Well, it was really incredible. I my first entree to the park was um, I think in 2017, and maybe you can go back with me if you can remember the dates of when the discussion maybe started. I, I think our first community meetings were in 2017 around the park idea and seeing if the community was even ready for something like that and to be able to support it with the volunteers and with members and obviously resources to make sure that it really comes to fruition. Yeah. So I will say that that predates me by a few years um, <laughs> as I didn't arrive until 2020, but I know when they, they were shopping landscape designers and, and architects. And, and so once the sake was chosen, they came in and really started engaging the community, um, holding focus groups to find out what it was that people wanted in the park. And so, yeah, about, I think we acquired land in 2016 and um, 2017 and started holding the stakeholder meetings and then uh, did that for a couple of years in the design process and then kicked off uh, construction a year or so later. And just for people who might be tuning in that don't really know the history of that land mass, that was the... I don't know if it was called an interchange or, or what it was called that CSX, the rail lines had a hundred or 200 acres in that area, which is very close to downtown Lakeland. Um, most people who have lived here and driven Kathleen road really hadn't paid much attention to it because it was covered up in overgrowth and trees. And um, then it has a, um, a downward slope to Lake Bonnet. Um, what was that called before 
um, or what what was it used for? Maybe. Well, it was a um, it was a steam engine yard back in the day, and so at, at a point, and when we actually talk about this in the Watson Clinic Gallery and the history of the Atlantic Coast Railway and and all of that, but. It was it was the largest service center for steam engines uh, in Central Florida. So all the trains came through here, and and I've read and been told that Lakeland was actually bigger than Orlando and Tampa at a point because of the fact that that rail yard was here in Central Florida. And post World War II, you know, the diesel engine technology took over, steam engines became antiquated, and slowly that uh, center died off. And then became what most people recognized it as prior to the construction of Bonnet Springs Park. And so even when I got here in 2020, it was overgrown and there was garbage and it was an illegal trash dump. And it was kind of an eyesore, you know, just a couple minutes away from a beautiful revitalized downtown Lakeland. Yeah, I think that's really important for our listeners to understand is that the neighborhood surrounding the area as well, um, whether behind RP Funding Center or um, the Crescent Hills neighborhood, Crescent Heights, Crescent yes. Heights yes. neighborhood that's just um, west of Bonnet Springs Park. Those neighborhoods were bifurcated by the development of Kathleen Road, George Jenkins Boulevard, and then also Harden and Sykes and around RP funding. So there wasn't a lot of connectivity to the area. And I think that's probably why it was um, just an eyesore and people didn't really pay attention to the, the, to the old rail yard um, and we kind of drove past it all the time. And plus, too, I don't think that the train industry and the railroad industry really was um, participatory in, in, in offering that as a resource or land that could be used for other things. So really that vision that came about from Mr. Bunch and then the Barnett family is a huge coup for the community. Not many, not many cities have 160 plus acres that are walkable from downtown area. Um, just sitting there not being utilized. So can you talk a little bit about also the mitigation efforts that it took? Because I think that's something that, you know, as a city of Lakeland commissioner, infrastructure is a big part of our job. It's not really sexy to talk about. You know, it's not really that <laughs> exciting because you don't see, you know, water and, and you know, the wastewater um, lines that we have to run throughout the city or even with regard to roads or with regard to mitigation efforts on a park like that to make it usable what had to happen before we even had this beautiful park? What what are some of the steps that had to occur? That's a that's a great point and a great question. So there we have millions and millions and millions of dollars of infrastructure underground that people will never see and, and didn't know. So one of the things that they used to do when they would build railways is is use arsenic as a weed control or whatever it was. Well, when they left, it was too expensive to clean it up. So it's like, we're just going to let it sit. And so you have this land that is contaminated. And we went to CSX and they said, absolutely not. You cannot have this land. Certainly can't make it a public park. And so at that point, we engaged FDEP and said, hey, look, this is what we want to do. Our experts in Sasaki who are the landscape architects have said, this is how we can remediate the arsenics that are on the ground and make it safe. And uh, for, you know, humans to be on the property. <clears throat> so we ended up scraping the entire two feet of the whole railway site. And that's where the mountains come from. And so you can either use those arsenic soils and you can contaminate somebody else's property or you can bury them um, and, and encapsulate them because it's a non-leaching, non-moving metal and so we buried them deep in the earth and we put netting around them. And then we brought in over 300,000 cubic yards of certified arsenic-free soils to ensure that the public is safe. We actually received an award from DEP for doing that um, because it was so innovative. And, and honestly, uh, unless you have the means that, that we had at our disposal, most people or organizations wouldn't have been able to do this. Yeah, and, and FDEP is the Florida <coughs> Department of Environmental Protection, um, just so people understand that this is something uh, that's a sustainable park. It's something that um, the team really was cognizant of in the planning, you know, and pursuit of making this happen for the community at large. So that's kind of, that's where we were. You know, I yeah. wanted to give the groundwork, no pun intended, to how we got to where we are right now. And um, it's a several-year process. So then you come on board in 2020 and you 
um, are hired as the CEO of the park, a board of directors oversees um, the park. And, and maybe a quick historical point for reference is that um, not only were there donors who were involved in, in, in getting the site and working with designers to plan the site and how this would be a community park that is privately funded and open to the public, but that um, it was all volunteer in the beginning. And then now we move to the point of where that volunteer guide guiding group said, we've got to hire a CEO. So um, how did we, how did, how are we so lucky in Lakeland to bring you and your team in um, on such a huge project? Well, it's, um, it's kind of an interesting, how did I get here story? Um, I, I came from private industry and I was not a public sector guy. I worked in water parks and theme parks my whole career. And and in 2017, I got I, I moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma to, to work on another privately funded public park. And um, and that's really what the, the experience there was what enabled me to uh, to get this position and and come out and basically open up another one of these uh, community gifts that was uh, you know, largely donated by a, a very philanthropic family and community as a whole. And, um, there, there's not many of these around the country. It's, it's extremely special, certainly in a city, the size of Lakeland, which is a small city, um, to have an asset that, you know, we've got well over a hundred million dollars in construction and, and to, and to think about the fact that, you know, primarily 80 donors, 80 major donors, uh, and, and one significant family in the Barnett family made this, this whole thing possible. Yeah, it has um, been a long work in progress. And I think that everything we've talked about so far, you know, within Lakeland Vision, there are four focus areas of, you know, jobs for a vibrant ec economy, lifelong education, activities for a diverse community and strong and safe neighborhoods are four of the areas that Lakeland Vision works in. And we feel like one of the reasons why we decided as a board of directors to invite Bonnet Springs and, and the CEO and our vice president of programming and to talk about what's going on out there is not only that history. I think the history is really important because it's something that people could have turned their eyes away from and that could have just sat vacant for years and years and years and not been accept accessible for people all over the state of Florida and a, a true gift, as you mentioned, to the community at large. I think that it represents a lot of different opportunities for Lakeland and beyond. And so with that being said, I'd like to invite um, Kirsten, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about some of the programming activities you've done this first year um, out at the park and, and the engagement that you've been able to do with your team and, and bringing families and activities together. And maybe if you just want to hit the highlights of those, that'd be awesome. Sure. We've had a few really large events, like our recent Hispanic Heritage Celebration, Bienvenido a BSP, which was really successful and involved a lot of community partners um, and had lots of great performances, cultural performances, um, and ended with a great concert that night. Um, we've also, we just had our birthday celebration that you mentioned, where we had a lot of people at the park and it was activities all day long. Um, we've had a lot of great fitness classes recently where we're partnering with businesses in the community to come out and showcase what they can do. Um, something that we're especially proud of is we have started doing um, free field trips this fall for our students in Central Florida. And we're doing a lot of um, other programming and education during days off school and early release days, and we're just starting that up, so we'll have a lot more coming with that. We have a really big event coming up for um, the Christmas time. It's called Light Up BSP, and we'll be announcing more of that soon, um, but that's in the month of December, and we'll have a couple of weeks of lights on at the park and some other activities. There's so much that's been going on. I know you did some spring break activities too, where you had yes. visitors from all over. Um, there's 168 acres. Yeah, that, that's property. our total property size. So the total yeah. property is 168 acres. So mm -hmm. there are, why don't we talk about, you know, the number of miles and the pathways. And I know you, we have a, an education center there and boathouse that can be accessed um, by student groups and different things. So if you could maybe share a little bit about the basics of the park, um, and then our, our listeners, we can, they can hear more about specific activities, too, in that first year. I think we have a total of about five miles of pathways. Yeah. 
And we have one um, pathway around the whole park called the Circulator. It's a mile and a half. So we've used that for our BSP 5K um, and a bunch of other things. We have the Alzheimer's Walk coming up in December as well. Um, we have a walking club that uses that uh, trail and other trails in the park um, when they get together. And we also have the Nature Center, as you mentioned. So we have a few different places where we have uh, we consider exhibits or galleries. So the Watson Clinic Gallery and the Welcome Center is the history of the park. The Nature Center is all about what you can find in the park, learning more about the animals and the plants and everything, the water. Um, great interactive exhibits for all ages, really. And then we also have the Butterfly House. So we have some more educational um, interpretation coming into the Butterfly House. But right now you can see all of the native butterflies and probably interact with a docent there. So all of these um, these places in the park have volunteer docents that have learned a lot about those spaces and can share it with our guests we love our volunteers, and especially our docents. They've gone through some extra training um, so that they know a little bit more about these spaces and can share it with everybody that comes through. So, you know, when you think about a park, sometimes we think just about swings and merry-go-rounds and slides and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about there are activities like that at our park and that are really fun for families to enjoy and even multiple sites of those. I don't know if you want to highlight a few of those as well. Yeah, we have the Rada Family Playground, which is on a hillside and has lots of different things to do um, and cool natural objects in it that are part of the playground. Uh, we just made Los Trompos, which we had brought in for grand opening. It's an art installation that was made in Mexico, um, and it's these spinning tops, and probably a lot of people know about them already because they were much loved, and they were here temporarily for grand opening, but everybody loved them so much that we brought it back permanently. It has a better home um, right by the playground, and right by Mabel the owl, um, which is a play structure that you can climb on and slide down. Um, and then you mentioned the boathouse. We have a lot of activities that happen there in our education realm, like birding and um, and just spotting uh, animals in the park and also along the boardwalk that goes through the lagoon. Um, and in the on the boardwalk, you can go into the back of the um, lagoon area, and it feels really like you are just in another space place and we also just have a new trail that josh um worked on that's called the monarch yep trail. monarch trail so it's our first kind of natural trail um it's from the nature center to the butterfly house and goes through the woods um, which is a different experience um, in the park that's brand new so you can find that trail um, it goes off of the circulator and also kind of in the nature center area. Um, it's about a, I think it's a quarter of a mile trail and it's new and exciting cause it's a different experience and you can kind of see things from a different perspective in the park. Well, it's funny cause when you brought up the butterfly house, we have the mayor's monarch challenge right now that we're part of nationally, yeah. um, in the city of Lakeland and that our teams from parks and rec and especially in our horticulture departments are mm -hmm. trying to galvanize and have monarchs, you know, be more prolific and how important they are to our entire environment. So yeah. that's exciting to have that piece as well. We participated in a citizen science project um, recently where we invited the public and also our volunteers to come out and count caterpillars and eggs and uh, monarch butterflies that they saw. And they contribute to data that's worldwide. Um, that's what all citizen science projects are. And so we have a bird um, event coming up pretty soon too. I think in December, we're going to try to do that. So one of the cool things about the park is not only the lifelong learning, because I feel like I see on social media all the time, um, mm -hmm. Bonnet Springs parks are, you know, you're inviting, like you said, the walkers club and you have, you know, these learning opportunities and learning about science and um, environment and also like a sense of community because this park wouldn't exist without a lot of different community partners. And I know we've mentioned the nature center, we've mentioned the Ruthven family playground, but we also have the canopy walk, 
which is pretty unique. I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit as well. Yeah, the the Crenshaw Canopy Walk is, you know, it, it's, it's basically, a it's not quite the treetops, but middle tree uh, walkway, but we have such a huge um, elevation change on the property. So when you come off of the Allen & Company family lawn, there is a pathway that stays at that grade. And as the land falls away, you stay up. So you're about 25 feet up in the air at the highest point. And it, it meanders through the trees along the uh, Blanton Family Lagoon and then brings you back around to the Lakeland Regional Health Circulator. So it's probably one of the guests' favorite elements in the park just because it's so unique. And I, I've heard there's one in Atlanta. I haven't been there. But um, this type of canopy walk is not um, its not a common thing that you're going to come across when you go to many uh, park environments like this. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of accessibility too for all um, different ability abilities and you know varying abilities. There's a you have a shuttle really that's an open air. It's not really a golf cart. It's a little bit bigger. I guess it is it's a called golf a cart. tram. It's a tram, and mm-hmm. so it goes. So somebody like my mom, who's older and not as mobile, she's able to. When we visit the park, we'll go to the welcome center. We'll hop on the tram and ride where she wants to ride, and she might get off and do the canopy walk for a little bit, and then we pick it right back up. But there's mm-hmm. One of the great things about this park, and I and I think it's it's a push, you know, worldwide to be um, accessible, you know, for everyone to be able to enjoy these things and the benefits of being outdoors and learning new things and and also communing with one another and with nature. Um, I think that this park has done that really, really well. I think it's been intentional. I always like to say we have something for just almost everyone. So. If you're young, we have playgrounds. And if you're, you know, middle-aged or in your early 20s or 30s, we have a rooftop bar and we have, you know, the different programs like stargazing that we do. And, and if you're into fitness, we have the, the circulator that you can run on. And if you're not into fitness, you can take the tram or if you have a, you know, a a mobility challenge, we have the three trams that will drive you and stop at every single attraction in the park. It's free. It's free. Um, you know, and, and when, as a board, we were discussing this and, you know, the, the magic kingdom and and we're not a theme park or we're not Disney, but it's 108 acres. We're 168 acres. So when you talk about being for all people, you have to come up with a solution that makes the park accessible for those who can't walk that massive, uh, piece of property at a time. And that's, that's where the tram idea was born out of. And then, You know, your other point about accessibility in the Ruthven Family Playground, it has what we call a universal design. And so there's a singular pathway at ADA grade that stops at each location or has access to each location in that playground. So if a child is in a wheelchair, they do have another mobility challenge. They may not be able to climb on every element in the playground, but they can get there with their brothers and sisters or their friends or whoever it is, their classmates that they're with and still participate in that recreational activity. And that's so important for us. And so the entire park was built with that universal design premise that it is wheelchair accessible in every aspect, which is why when you get to the Qantas uh, Cares for Kids Treehouse, you have that really long ramp to get up there. Well, that was intentional so that we could make sure everybody could get to the treehouse to play. Yeah. I think the accessibility part is so important because not only are we encouraging lifelong education and people being together and, and the park is so big that you can do different parts of the park. You're not going to, you don't have to see it all at once. And the lovely thing is it's open every day of the year, I think. Yeah. We're 365 day a year operation. Yes. It's a great place when you have out of town visitors come in like in-laws and um, other friends that you know you want to do something that's free and engaging and fun. And then there's the event center, too, which I think has had been quite busy since you opened. Very. Um, and it's another site, you know, here in Polk County and in Central Florida and on the I-4 corridor that people can access and utilize for meetings or weddings or whatever they see fit. So that was actually born out of the um, public engagement meetings that Sasaki had. And so when they ask the public, what is it that you would like to see in Bonner Springs Park? Do you want soccer fields and basketball? And believe it or not, an event center that would seat 400 was one of the top rated. um, I think they dropped like marbles or something. And it got the more got more votes than almost anything else. And so we built a catering facility where you can pick your caterer. We don't force you to use an in-house catering team. We have a full commercial kitchen and, um, 
and and the community has embraced that uh, venue wholeheartedly, and um, it, it does stay quite busy. And and the proceeds from the use of that go back in to help the funding of the park. So when somebody comes out and they they rent the event center, they buy food in in our you know cafe or something in the gift shop. We're a nonprofit. We don't make money on that, but it does help offset our operating expenses on an annual basis. So it's giving back to the community in a different sort of way. Absolutely. And it really is a great partnership that this was a privately funded 501c3 initiative that, uh, you know, a few citizens decided would be important for the area. And then a lot of other volunteers came on board to, to help support the mission and vision of what was going to happen in that space. And really, I think from a city standpoint, we're excited to see the growth of development that's happening close by um, with the some multifamily and some retail that's not going to be too far from the park. And now we're just working on that connectivity so that it's passable for pedestrians and bicyclists. That's something that we're continuing to work on in partnership with, with Bonnet Springs and the city of Lakeland. Um, we've talked about, you know, the education aspect and the activities for a diverse community and how that ties into Lakeland Vision. And um, one of the activities for a diverse community is we've talked about parks and recreation and health. And I think sometimes people don't realize that parks are a good source of good, healthy choices, being outside, walking on that circulator, you know, doing activities out there that are uh, for wellness and for health, but also the mental health of our community. I think that Bonnet Springs really offers peace and quiet and a place to sort of commune with nature where it's not, there's not a lot of music being pumped in. It's not um, high overdrive octane. I mean, we have events like the anniversary we just had, and then obviously grand opening a year ago was very busy and, and a lot of activity going on, but it's a very peaceful place to be and enjoy. Absolutely. So, you know, we, Kirsten and I, we, we love the major events, right? They're a lot of fun to put on. It's fun to see families come out and, and, and put these major concerts on. But at the same time, to your point, we will do that on a Saturday or Sunday. And then Monday, we're back down to Tranquil, come out at 6 a.m., run or walk, bike, whatever it is, and, and really get back to nature. You know, we kind of, we love it when people put their cell phones away and, and we love it when the kids aren't on electronic devices and they're just rolling down the hills or playing in the playgrounds. And, and it's, it's, it is to your point, it's refreshing from a mental kind of, let's just unplug and, and get outside and soak up some sunshine and, and just be with our family. And, and that's really what we love to see at the end of the day is as much fun as the major events are. It's, it's the other five or six days a week that really help people kind of unwind and, and, and de-stress just a little bit. It's a great place to have lunch or coffee. <laughs> I have a lot of coffee meetings out there. Um, I also, my mom and I were out at lunch last week and it's fun to see little kids on their, they have their helmets on and their scooter and they're riding on the sidewalk around the Allen family event space. And so yeah. it's really a cool place. Um, we just have a couple minutes left. I don't know, Kirsten, if you want to add anything else to future programming or anything else that we missed maybe. Yeah, this month we have um, a lot of things happening on um, in the next couple of weeks. Everything can be found on our website um, under the calendar of events. And if you follow our social media, um, Instagram and Facebook are great to find out what's happening now and in the future. Um, so that's at Bonnet Springs Park on both of those. Um, and this month we have a, a bubble event, a giant bubble event and bubble activities coming up on one of the adventure days, which is the days off school, um, I think on the 10th of November. And we have a, um, a workout on the 11th on Veterans Day. We also have caffeine and gasoline, which is our car meetup event. Um, and then on the 18th, we have a kids fishing clinic um, from 10 to 1, which is going to be awesome. Kids learn how to fish, and uh, the first 200 kids will get a free fishing pole. Um, and then, like I said, we have more information coming up soon about Light Up BSP, which is December 15th through the 31st. And there'll be a lot of activities to do during that holiday time. And like you said, lots of time with your family. Uh, we think it's a great place to be during the holidays. Well, I so appreciate both of you being here. I love full disclosure. I volunteer <laughs> with Bonnet Springs Park. It's one of my favorite things. I don't know how I was fortunate enough to be asked to participate, but I have loved every minute of it. 
I've loved um, having you all come on as staff and, and come to Lakeland and really share your gifts with the community too in this very, very special place. So thank you both for coming. And thank you for tuning in to Listen Lakeland. Your feedback is valued, and we encourage you to head over to www.lakelandvision.org to participate in our monthly survey related to today's show topic. Listen Lakeland is brought to you as a collaborative project between Lakeland Vision, the City of Lakeland, and Hall Communications, a community working together to provide an exceptional quality of life. Thank you for being with us.